So, uh, welcome everyone, uh, those in person and, and online. Um, uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge tr traditional owners of the land that we all meet. Um, and in this, where we are, it's the uh, Wajak Poop people of the Noongar Nation. Um, and I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Uh, this, uh, just a bit of housekeeping first. Uh, just if everyone can mute their microphones, just to make sure that we don't get any cross noise. I think everyone's pretty good at this now, but just as a quick reminder. Um, and uh, if there's any questions that people feel like having or interaction while we're in the middle of this, if you're online, just place your questions in the chat. Um, we have Sandra who will be monitoring that and can help me uh, manage that towards the end. And um, just as an introduction, my name's Mark Lindsay. I'm a Mineral Resources uh, digital, digital Science Lead. Glad to have our visitor, Rohit Tandra, from the Uni University of New South Wales. Um, Rohit's a senior lecturer in data science, um, comes from the School of Mathematics and Statistics, um, and is, has a particular interest in AI, um, based in deep learning, and how that can be applied to geoscience models and mineral exploration. We also have Esan Fabrikash, um, from a research associate from the Earthbike Group in the University of Sydney. Um, similar research interests to ours in multi-dimensional mineral prospectivity modelling and geological remote sensing and geostatistics. Um, I think I've said enough. Uh, so, was Rohit, you were going to take it away? Yeah, okay, thank you. So, machine learning for mineral exploration and data privacy. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Um, Hassan will uh, go first. Can you hear me? Yep. Absolutely. Oh, perfect. So, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. And, uh, well, first of, all, first of all, I would like to thank Mark and also Syrup for giving us this opportunity to present our recent projects. And also, thank you, Rohit, for including me in this presentation. And uh, uh, so, yeah, next slide, please. So, uh, I'm going to first uh, talk about uh, our two recent projects. The first one is, uh, is about the machine learning based framework that we have recently developed in the Earthquite Group for uh, prospectivity mapping of critical minerals. And uh, next, I'm going to talk about another project, which is about you know, geological remote sensing and how we have used autoencoders to reduce the dimension of you know, our feature space and also mapping uh, lithological units. And later, Ruit is going to, uh, we'll go through two of his own projects and uh, talk to you about spatial temporal modeling for mineral exploration and also the application of convolutional neural networks for processing remote sensing data. Um, next slide. Well, uh, uh, the first project that, as I mentioned, the first project that I'm going to talk about is the framework that we have recently developed based on machine learning methods for prospective mapping of critical minerals. And as you know, critical minerals is the buzzword of these days. And uh, so as the technology advances, we need you know, more diverse uh, 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 commodities and also metals, advanced technologies like those required for a cleaner energy transition like nickel, cobalt, chromium, and others. And uh, they're required for solar panels, wind turbines, and also electric vehicles and others. Uh, so, uh, next slide, please. And uh, so, as you know, critical minerals are uh, required for a clean energy transition. And uh, uh, as, as you can see in this graph, there are lots of different uh, commodities and elements required in uh, uh, High tech, uh, tech, no, high tech actually products like electric vehicles and uh, many of them uh, actually can be found in Australia, throughout Australia and uh, the government has listed 26 of them as critical to the country. And uh, uh, next slide please. And uh, you, in this map actually you can see uh, the critical mineral occurrences throughout Australia and also the mineralization types of them. Uh, it's an animation, read if you can click. Uh, there's an animation there. Yes, as you can see, there are different mineralization types for these mineral occurrences. And uh, in this study, we targeted uh, mafic and ultra mafic uh, deposits, and our target commodities were uh, cobalt, chromium, and nickel. 
if you click read, I would think. One more, and yeah, our target study, sorry, can you get back to the previous? And uh, uh, our actually target area was established in Australia, and uh, we actually trained our model based on all the mineral occurrences that we had in, in, outside in South Australia, but our, what we actually created the prospective map for only the Gola Craton. And uh, next slide, please. And uh, our framework is actually based on the mineral systems approach. And uh, as you know, we have five different components. You know, we have source, then we have tra uh, transport, and then uh, traps, deposition, and finally preservation. And based on these, you know, the different stages of mineralization, we uh, created different features. And each of them, you know, they are based on a, a specific uh, data layer. And uh, so we created more than 500 different features and that we can uh, call them, you know, spatial proxies. And uh, uh, each of them is correlated with, you know, and uh, related to one of these, you know, stages of mineralization in mafic and ultramafic related uh, critical minerals. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, we used uh, all the, all the public you know data sets that are available in South Australia and uh, some of them are pro have been provided by the federal government some are have been provided by the state government and uh, we based on a big volume of publicly available data sets we created more than 500 different features and for example here you can see four four of you know the data layers that we have used digital elevation models uh, faults uh, electric, uh, total magnetic intensity and also residual gravity of the study area. In addition to the prospectivity map, uh, by analyzing the features, we can, you know, uh, understand which uh, features are more important to our uh, target mineralization, and uh, they can aid in, uh, uh, for, they can actually guide future exploration data collection uh, requirements. And uh, next slide, please. And uh, in our framework, we have actually used uh, a variety of machine learning methods to address different challenges that we have in mapping prospective zones of critical minerals. Uh, one of the challenges, we have actually two you know, major challenges in uh, prospective mapping of critical minerals. The first one is uh, the low number of training samples that we have. And the second one is actually the uh, negative samples. As you know, in, uh, for example, in the supervised machine learning methods, we can use uh, at the same time, we actually need at the same time positive samples and also negative samples. That we have addressed all these challenges in our framework. Uh, so we addressed the challenge of uh, uh, low number, the challenge of low number of uh, training samples using the improved, uh, an improved generative adversarial network. Actually, this method has been uh, developed by uh, Ruhit and his team, and uh, we actually use that in uh, our framework for mineral perspective mapping. And this method is actually the, a combination of uh, two oversampling method and also data generation method. One is SMOTE and the other one is GAN. SMOTE actually, uh, SMOTE stands for a synthetic, uh, synthetic minority, uh, synthetic minority, uh, sorry, Forgot that synthetic minority oversampling technique, and GAN stands for uh, generative adversarial network. And we used actually these uh, this method actually to increase the number of our training samples and uh, actually created you know some synthetic positive samples for our uh, model. And in addition to uh, SMOTE, can we use the autoencoders uh, to reduce the dimension of our feature space from round, from as I mentioned from more than 500 features to uh, less than 100 features. And uh, also we use the uh, positive and unlabeled learning, which is a new approach in machine learning to address the problem of negative samples. And uh, using uh, this, actually the PUL learning, you know, methods can be uh, used as a wrapper of uh, any supervised machine learning method like uh, random forest. And in this study, we use the combination of positive and unlabeled learning with uh, a random forest as the main classifier and uh, predicted uh, the probability of mineralization in our target region. And uh, next slide, please. And uh, here you can see uh, the prospective map of nickel mineralization in the study area hosted by mafic and ultra mafic intrusive rocks. And, uh, 
as you can see, there is a good correlation between uh, the known mineral occurrences. You know that it is, it is, for example, as you can see, it's around seven mineral occurrences in the whole color pattern. And the model uh, was actually, you know, uh, somehow successful in predicting those locations. Also, it was successful in predicting uh, some greenfield, you know, areas that can be targeted in the future. And uh, also, uh, uh, um, yeah, as you can see, the, uh, the prospective map shows a strong, actually, I can say, a correlation with the known uh, prospective zones. And uh, in the lower uh, map, actually, you can see uh, the overlay of uh, prospective zones we actually on the uh, liturgical units that we have in the study area. And uh, next slide, please. And uh, in, in the second project uh, that I'm uh, going to talk about, it's about uh, the application of autoencoders for reducing the dimension of uh, remote sensing data sets. And uh, this graph that you can see here is, uh, is uh, actually uh, it has been published in one of our papers in uh, remote sensing our environment. As you, as you know, remote sensing data can be acquired uh, using different platforms, satellites, or, or, uh, drones, and also ground-based instruments like a tripod. You know, you can put a hyperspectral hyper sensor on a tripod and, for example, acquire data in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, an open fit mine. And uh, using remote sensing data, we can target different features, liturgical units, alter, alteration zones, tectonic structures. And also, if you have a hyperspectral sensor, you can target indicator minerals of different alteration zones as well. And uh, Using machine learning, actually, we try to uh, map these features, you know, by considering at the same time the uh, specific spectral behavior of our target features and also the remote sensing data sets that we have. There are different types of machine learning methods that we can use uh, with remote sensing data and to process them, dimensional introduction methods, classification, clustering, regression analysis, and deep learning. Autoencoders uh, can be classified under both dimensional energy reduction and also deep learning methods. And uh, next slide, please. So in this study, actually, we used uh, uh, optical remote sensing data that are known as uh, passive, uh, actually, data. And uh, we used three different uh, types of optical remote sensing data. And uh, we applied three different uh, dimensional energy reduction methods, uh, PCA, or principal component analysis, which is a famous method in dimensional energy reduction, and uh, a canonical autoencoder, and also stacked autoencoders. And we compared the results uh, for mapping, uh, actually, uh, uh, mythological units that we have in this study area. And uh, we applied k-means clustering method to the output components of these dimensional energy reduction methods. And as I mentioned, we have used uh, three different types of optical remote sensing data that they all are have been have been acquired using passive uh, sensors. And uh, in addition to passive sensors, we have also active sensors that have been less, you know, used in the studies of mineral ex ex exploration and uh, can be actually addressed in, in maybe in future study. And uh, in this study, we used a Landsat 8, Aster, and also uh, Sentinel-2 data. Yes. Landsat, as you know, Landsat, uh, when I started remote sensing uh, data processing, you know, and I was, a under, I was an undergraduate student, and in that time, we only had access to Landsat 7 or 18 plus data on Aster. But nowadays, we have access to a variety of remote sensing data types, multispectral or hyperspectral data. And uh, recently, Landsat 9 has also been launched uh, by NASA, and uh, Landsat 8 is a multispectral remote sensing data, and it has uh, 11 spectral bands compared to ETM plus uh, the previous version of the Landsat data, satellites that has only eight. And uh, the, spe the spatial resolution of that is uh, 30 meters in VNIR and SWIR uh, spectral bands, and uh, it has also a panchromatic band, which is, you know, uh, which provides a special resolution of 15 meters. Uh, and we used, uh, uh, we actually removed thermal, uh, thermal infrared uh, bands from our study, uh, from our study, and we only use those spectral bands that are located in the VNIR and SWIR 
regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. In addition to Landsat 8, we, use, uh, we also used Aster data, which is also uh, another famous uh, remote sensing data type in, uh, for geological remote sensing studies. And uh, remote, uh, Aster data actually has 14 uh, spectral bands in three different uh, regions of uh, the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, VNIR, which stands for visible and near infrared, and SWIR, short wave infrared, and also TIR, thermal infrared. We actually used only VNIR and SWIR uh, spectral bands, and uh, the characteristic of uh, the aster that makes it, you know, special for geological studies is uh, the six bands that it, it has in the uh, region of this SWIR. It actually enables a geologist to discriminate between, between different uh, minerals since they show a specific spectral behavior in this region of the electromagnetic spectrum. So uh, uh, we used uh, VNIR and, and SWIR as the input to our dimensionality reduction methods. And in addition, these two sensors, we also used Sentinel-2 data that provides a spatial resolution of uh, 10 meters, actually. It provides the highest uh, resolution, spatial resolution among all the free optical remote sensing data that we have access to. Uh, it's, al it's also, again, a, a multispectral data type and also provides, as I mentioned, provides a spatial resolution of 10 meters. So, uh, and you can, in this graph, you can see the comparison between the uh, spectral bands of Sentinel-2 and also Landsat-8 and uh, Landsat-7. And uh, next slide, please. And uh, we actually, as I mentioned, we use the out the uh, spectral bands of these three uh, spectral data sets or remote sensing data as input to three different dimensionality reduction. And the output components of these uh, reduction methods were used as input to the clustering, Cayman's clustering method, to map to discriminate between different lithological money, uh, units, each showing a specific uh, uh, spectral behavior. And uh, autoencoders ha uh, have two uh, major parts. The first part is the encoder, and the second part is the decoder, actually. The thing that encoder tries to do is actually it uh, reduces the dimension of data to a code layer. For example, if we have uh, seven or eight spectral bands, we actually target two or three spectral bands for the code layer and reduce the, dump, uh, the number of uh, spectral uh, bands using the encoder. And then the, the decoder part of the autoencoders try to reconstruct the original data. And uh, then we, comp we can compare the original uh, input layers and also the uh, output of the model, and we can uh, uh, calculate the error of uh, these two. And we actually use the code layer in this study, we, used, we actually used the code layer as input to the clustering methods. And uh, next slide, please. In addition, in addition to a canonical autoencoder, we used a stacked autoencoder as well, which is uh, comprised of uh, three, uh, uh, actually in, in our study, we used three consecutive, you know, uh, stacked autoencoder, actually autoencoders and created a, a stacked autoencoder. And the, in a stacked autoencoder, the input of each autoencoder is actually the output of the previous autoencoder. So uh, this actually helps us to denoise the input data set further compared to the canonical autoencoder. And uh, next slide, please. And using uh, the output components of uh, these uh, three methods and also these data types, we created different clustered maps, as you can see on the right side, uh, using the uh, combination of these methods. So we have uh, nine different clustered maps. And in K-means, as you know, we, we need to set the number of clusters manually. So we use the elbow method to uh, determine the optimal K or optimal number of uh, clusters for each combination of these data sets and methods. And uh, based on the results, uh, we realized that the combination of uh, uh, Sentinel-2 and stacked autoencoder provides the most accurate results, and it is uh, correlated with the, the current geological map that we have in the study area. But, uh, we can see that some of the uh, units in the map has been merged in the cluster map. So, uh, in my opinion, we can use this approach to modify the current geological maps that we have in hand, and uh, we can yeah, also use uh, the cluster map as an input 
to uh, for uh, mineral passivity mapping uh, and add, 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 and use it as an additional layer for uh, for mineral passivity mapping. Um, that's all for me. And also on the uh, left side, you can see the current geological map of the study area that we have. And uh, yeah, that's all for me. And uh, over to you, Rit. And thanks, Esan. So uh, moving on, uh, this project we started uh, 2019, and uh, with uh, me and Dietma, we were supervising uh, Julian, who was a Master of Science student at, at the University of Sydney. And it's about uh, bringing uh, the current research uh, from Dietmar's group uh, together with machine learning uh, methods. Uh, so uh, it's coupling uh, deep learning with plate tectonics models uh, for mineral exploration. And uh, this uh, is published in all geology reviews. So uh, basically it's, uh, it's uh, about uh, uh, looking at uh, copper deposits, looking for copper deposits uh, that are derived from subduction zones. And uh, as our current uh, understanding is that uh, there are restriction, restricted observations from overriding plates, resulting in a knowledge gap in terms of processes occurring in con convergence zones through time. So uh, we basically, in this project, what we do, we bring uh, the G plates uh, model and uh, we generate data from the G-plates model to go back in time for over 100 million years as the plates are moving. <coughs> and we want to kind of grab uh, the data in terms of uh, the subduction zones, the thickness of the crust, and so on, this uh, geophysical data, and then associate it with, uh, uh, with uh, the copper deposits. So as you can see here, we have... Uh, Right, uh, we have a G plates, uh, plate tectonics model that shows how um, the Pangaea continent broke uh, over the last uh, 200 million years. And as it is breaking, there's the subduction zones and the plate, uh, the crust is uh, changing in different locations. And with those uh, difference in the change over time, we have uh, 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 porphyry uh, deposits being formed, as you can see on the figure on the right. So uh, th basically the, the challenge is in extracting the, the spatio-temporal information from the G-plates uh, model, and then uh, also looking at a lot of papers out there with a, a very comprehensive literature review, and that's what Julian was doing, to look at where the copper deposits are and at what uh, form uh, time uh, zone those deposits were formed. So uh, basically, uh, this is uh, the, the the data out there about the uh, age of the formation of the different uh, uh, deposits. As you can see in yellow, you have the Quaternary Eocene uh, era, and then there's the Neogene era era in, uh, in, uh, uh, in orange, and then you have the Triassic, Triassic era in uh, purple, and these are uh, at different time zones, different uh, dip types of deposits uh, uh, were formed. So uh, what is G-Plates? G-Plates is a plate tectonics model, and this is developed by a Dietmar's group at Edbyte, and uh, this uh, is a free and open source software, which you can download. And there is a wrapper with G plates, it's called Pi G plates. So we can, you don't have to have, uh, with the G plate software, you have a good user interface. And with the Pi G plates, you can develop Python notebooks that makes uh, the workflow more automated. So we have used Pi, G plates, and this is the user interface of the G plates uh, software. And this is the overall uh, uh, workflow of the framework. Basically, we have this uh, North America and the South American data set, and that data set is uh, basically extracted from various papers, and that was a time intensive uh, process. And so we have the data collection from articles, publications, geological survey, and GeoRock. Uh, so from those outlets, we collected all this uh, data, and Julian did this. 
and basically we uh, have uh, the G plates uh, model uh, that is the 2016 version and uh, with the, the Pi G plates together with G plates we uh, create uh, for every uh, million year back in time for more than a hundred million years we have basically data and uh, this is spatial temporal data and we do core registration data cleaning and wrangling and then we have the machine learning model and basically the machine learning model actually uh, is trained on the data and uh, this is uh, one of the problems that Ahsan has pointed out that we have positive data sets but we do not have negative data sets right so we have to synthetically generate the negative data and uh, that was done uh, so uh, the, in terms of the data visualization, we see uh, some of the key, what are the key features of the data, what are the things that we have extracted from Pi G plates, spatial temporal data, some of them, for example, we have absolute subducting convergence magnitude, subducting plate volume, upper ocean crust carbonate percentage, deep sea carbonate sediment thickness, deep sea sediment thickness, distance to the nearest trench, uh, in degrees and deep sea carbonate sediments total sediment thickness ratio to the top and basically with that uh, we see um, uh, uh, this is the, the, the data and uh, with that we take that data and we use the data from uh, the, the papers extracted and we apply machine learning to the data. So uh, we have a correlation matrix uh, to see how uh, correlated the data is uh, uh, amongst the other each of the features so some of the features are more highly correlated than the others for example we see the subduction convergence uh, uh, magnitude is highly correlated to the uh, absolute vector is uh, highly correlated to the orthogonal vector and then we have the down uh, uh, also highly correlated to the down going plate marginal orthogonal vector. So some of the features are more highly correlated to the others. Uh, and then uh, basically we used a group of machine learning uh, methods, uh, which includes support vector machines, random forests, multi-layer perceptrons, and Gaussian process models. And basically this is our, after doing 30, experimental runs with the 8020 split train into test split this is the results for north america and south america and uh, basically there's a, a bit of a class imbalance we see the true positive true negative the precision recall and the iuc scores uh, actually if you look at these scores basically the machine learning model has been, uh, all of them have been very well, good, but uh, the support vector machine on the top one, in both of the cases, the support vector machine gives us uh, uh, very good uh, results compared to the rest. But even the rest, the worst ones, such as the Gaussian process at the bottom, the results are still in uh, above 90%, which is uh, not that bad. So uh, we basically using those uh, predictions here, we show for the best model out there for the different uh, age range, the uh, areas where there's a very high prospectivity of porphyry copper deposits, uh, high prospectivity, high and moderate prospectivity and low and moderate prospectivity and very low prospectivity and so on. So. Uh, this is what we see in the North American uh, region. And then we have uh, the Andes belt, basically the South American region uh, for the different uh, time zones, uh, 23 to 3 million years. And uh, North America, we are looking at 80, 60 to 80 million years. The different uh, zones and the different uh, prospectivity maps are shown. And uh, moving on, uh, it's 
Okay, uh, please, uh, please, if you could mute your microphone, that will be great. Thank you. So the, the, the other thing I just wanted to ask you as a favor is, can, is there someone in your organization who can clarify? Yeah. Dominic, a generator, I someone who generates electricity like on the grid on the day. Is unable to provide a dedicated line to the client if it's more than one kilometer away. I mean, I was tempted to leave it on. But see what happens. Sorry about that. So we have, uh, you can see that at different time zones, uh, the the uh, 23 million years, then there's 47 and there's 66 million years, and the prospectivity maps slightly changes. Very high prospectivity uh, is 23 to 3 million years in this zone here, but uh, 66 to uh, 47 million years ago in that zone, there was not very high prospectivity in that area, and this is all due to the change of the plate motions, the subduction zone, the different uh, types of uh, <coughs> uh, processes that were ongoing at those, at the time zone. So um, basically, uh, we have given a framework which can be used in other regions, but the, the reason why we have selected North America and South America and those zones specifically, because there's a lot of study of uh, you know the porphyry copper deposits in those zones and basically uh, uh, we we could uh, look at other regions but we do not have that much of studies in the other regions so it's all about how much available data we have and uh, basically the major conclusion is that uh, most uh, of the important uh, process uh, the parameters linked to the formation of Corpora systems are across uh, the North and the South America is the absolute magnitude of convergence velocity. This magnitude is uh, on average faster at time when these systems formed as opposed to the rates related to the emplacement of non-prospective intrusions. So that was the most uh, important part of that study. Um, then uh, moving on, um, this is a project we started uh, with uh, Mark, and this is a, was our official collaboration uh, last year. Uh, this still project is still ongoing. Subash is uh, no, uh, left to the industry, but uh, we are uh, working on this where we are looking at uh, using uh, unsupervised machine learning uh, for drill core analysis data. And uh, basically the idea is uh, we have uh, this uh, drill core data of uh, from different drill sites of up to two kilometers, right? And then the data ha has a number of properties where more than 80 features are there in the data. We would like to see, we'd like to co basically compare the different drill cores to understand or connect how the drill cores, to possibly connect the drill cores in understanding what is below, right? And uh, basically this is challenging as of course the data is not leveled. So we are using unsupervised machine learning and basically the idea of you, the framework basically is to have some type of summary statistics of those different drills. So that you now at the moment when you go to the website from where we get the data, you just, the, the it's just the drill code ID is the main information. <coughs> But if we use machine learning and we kind of uh, divide, let's say, the different depths, uh, you know, maybe of uh, every 200 meters, we would know at different depths what are the major, uh, you know, types of mineral deposits in the different depths and how they are changing over depths in the different locations. And so this is basically a methodology where we are going to use uh, principal component analysis and clustering methods which uh, we are comparing hierarchical clustering and k-means clustering, and it's a way to compress data. So that uh, project is ongoing, and uh, we hope to complete it by the end of the year. And uh, this project uh, we uh, did uh, with a multidisciplinary team from uh, Malaysia. Uh, we have 
from UTS and um, Hojart was in Iran and uh, Esan was partly in Iran then and then he was coming back here and then Dietma of course is here. It's about using deep learning or you via convolutional neural networks for lithological mapping. And uh, lithological mapping, of course, is very critical um, for studying mineralization in regions and uh, for prospectivity mapping. And uh, we know that uh, machine learning has a lot of potential. But uh, the thing is that uh, also machine learning and deep learning the types of data sets that they are more prominent is not remote sensing data. And here we are looking at different types of remote sensing data. Uh, so we have the OLI or Operation Land Imager and the ESTA data and sentiment, Sentinel data. So we have this uh, global uh, lithological map. Uh, uh, this was uh, published a uh, while ago in I mean, from the looks of it, of course, it's not from remote sensing and it's uh, uh, not very fine grained. And what we are looking at is more local regions and um, uh, and trying to use the remote sensing data to look at different lithologies. So this is basically from some studies of those areas that we are looking at. and. Um, the, the challenge here is, of course, going back to the thought that uh, convolutional neural networks and deep learning, they have been really prominent in uh, multimedia applications such as, you know, face recognition, vehicle recognition, autonomous driving, and you see um, uh, medical image uh, analysis, uh, detection of tumor, detection of uh, problems in the lungs, and so on. And uh, all these are uh, not necessarily the, these are very small images compared to remote sensing image. And in a remote sensing, in these applications, you have like a series of images, lots of data, small lots of data. Whereas in remote sensing, you have one large map basically. So, and that map is basically, if you are looking at multi-spectral and hyperspectral data, we are looking at uh, a series of uh, images, basically, in hyperspectral, which can go more than 100 bands, and each band is an image, essentially. And uh, if you are looking at, uh, you know, a resolution where you have a pixel for every um, meter and so on, you could be looking at a, at a smaller area, you know, just 20 by 50 kilometers or so, but it will be gigabytes of data. So there's a lot of data and it's about how much of data should we keep, how, much, how do we process the data and so on. So um, this is one way where we are looking at um, processing the data. So in uh, regular face recognition or object detection, you have image, image camera, you have uh, data in, from image camera or photos, and that is uh, directly you put it into give it into a convolutional neural network. But in when you have like one large data set, like a remote sensing data, you need to process it somehow so that you're looking at smaller regions and those regions are known as chips. And basically we are looking sliding windows of those chips as you can see in the visualization. And basically then it becomes a, a classification problem, supervised classification problem. And this is basically the entire framework. We have the different types of data we do some data processing, uh, sampling, we do a train test data split as usual. We have some refinement where we are looking at hyperparameter optimization, such as learning the rate of a neural network, how many hidden neurons to use, some other hyperparameters, number of trees in random forests, for example. But that is when we are using random forests. But this study, we have uh, kept uh, to convolutional neural networks, MLP and SVN. And in convolutional neural networks, you need to decide how, what is the size of the network, how many filters, how many max pooling layers you want to use. And basically, this is an example of a convolutional neural network where you have this image and you can think of these images as a uh, multispectral image. So you have seven times seven and six bands. 
and then they go through these different convolutions and the dropout is a way of regularization which tries to improve the model and basically this is uh, what we observed it's very similar to the previous study that Hassan was showing these maps and basically uh, we apply the three different methods and these are the maps from SVM, multilayer perceptron and uh, CNN. And uh, in our study, generally we have found that CNN basically uh, gives uh, one of the best results uh, or 100% classification uh, performance at times, looking at different uh, lithological uh, settings. So uh, basically CNN uh, is very promising and uh, some things that, are, uh, that can be done further is to look at uh, uncertainty quantification also of the predictions and uh, the ROC curves are there and uh, which uh, basically displays the nature of the class imbalance and so on and more analysis can be done and this whole uh, framework we have released as an open source software with a Jupyter notebook that is given with the paper and the paper is published in uh, your remote sensing and we are now applying the similar framework to um, for uh, alter alteration zones so detection of alteration zones which is uh, important it could be very useful for mineral prospecting and this is just an example of uh, how you see alteration zones uh, from up the top uh, and the different uh, color zones uh, basically show different uh, association with different types of minerals. And uh, so that project is ongoing and we are, uh, we'll finish this by the end of the year, hopefully. Uh, the other, so that's basically mostly towards the end of our talk. Uh, this says finally we present, uh, we are looking at uh, data augmentation with the uh, gener generative adversarial networks. So uh, what are generative adversarial networks? As Hassan has shown that in the past that he has used in other applications. Basically, it's a network that has kind of a twin model where there's a discriminator and a generator, and the goal of the Generator is to generate new data and discriminator's goal is to discriminate from real to fake data. So, uh, so basically the generator maximizes the probability of making the discriminator mistake its input as real. And the discriminator guides the generator to produce more and more realistic images. So the images can be data about, uh, you know, it could be different types of objects or it could be different types of um, different regions or zones in a remote sensing data set basically. So uh, this is uh, an example of how GAN, uh, this is just uh, uh, the GAN 101 basically uh, MNIST data set and how the discriminate uh, and the generator work together and over time basically more and more realistic images are formed. And these are images, as you can see, they are actually character recognition data set. That's the MNIS data set. And over time, you see the, in the beginning, it's very, uh, you know, blur, but over time, it becomes more and more realistic. So the similar way in the case when you will have, uh, we can have this approach into some type of non-image data and the non-image data is for example the spatio-temporal model uh, that i was talking about earlier where we are extracting data from the g plates model and we have less uh, negative sample data right so that kind of stuff we can use the GAN framework and uh, at the moment uh, we have applied the GAN framework in this paper to non-image data such as wine spam base, yeast, these are the UCI machine learning data rep repository. And basically we found that uh, with the, we have generated, combined the GAN with SMOTE and GAN and uh, others uh, and uh, compared with the non-oversampled non -over or the conventional uh, machine learning method. And you can see that 
data generation, basically Poka, Wayne, for example, in most of these, there's a huge difference with uh, the data generation with the combination of GAN and smoke. And uh, what is the road ahead? Basically, the road ahead is not very straight. It is uh, something uh, from uh, something like something from the movie Inception, I guess. <laughs> right. So uh, we need to kind of think more about how we can use these frameworks uh, and uh, work with the you guys uh, together. And at the moment, I am uh, in the process of uh, writing a review pro paper with a student Azal. Uh, in, in India, and we are uh, in uh, the year 2011. There was a paper that was about ensemble learning and uh, data augmentation with SMOTE combination with ensemble learning, and that was mostly used for class imbalance problems. Now, basically, uh, I mean, more than 10 years, 10, 11 years passed, and uh, because the, then there was no GAN in 2011, so now we are. Uh, Making, writing another review paper. It's a computational review paper where we are releasing the software with the paper, open source software with the paper. So we are now extending with the GAN, smart GAN combination with more ensemble learning approaches, such as new ones that came about in machine learning, such as XGBoost and other gradient boosting approaches. And uh, we see a uh, massive uh, difference in addressing class imbalance problems with those approaches. And I think that they, those can be extended to applications in mineral exploration and geoscience uh, applications. The other thing that we are uh, doing with uh, this type of uh, GAN framework, uh, uh, basically we are uh, applying this to climate extreme problems. Where yeah, so when you have like extreme value forecasting or in places where you have less data of extreme events, such as when you have storms and cyclones. So we are extending this again approach from this vision side more into spatial general modeling side and uh, applying uh, uncertainty quantification with Bayesian inference as well to the GAN uh, data augmentation framework and that we are applying to, uh, we have plans to apply that more for climate uh, projects where it's uh, to do with cyclones, storms and cyclones and precipitation or droughts. And uh, if there's like, uh, so a lot of this, uh, the class imbalance problems, they are seen as, uh, they are used, of course, for classification problems. That, what we are just trying to transform the classification problem into a prediction problem. So rather than using classification data sets, we can apply similar approaches or same approach, but just see the data, because at the end of the day, all prediction problems or regression problems can be converted into classification problems by discretizing the data, right? So a lot of work is already done in the class imbalance problems for uh, uh, classification data sets and multi, uh, classif multi class classification data sets. So we could extend those to more of multivariate data sets, multi step ahead, uh, extreme class uh, imbalance issues, and so on. So these areas are uh, some of uh, the things that we are looking at. And uh, maybe in the future we can think of how to look uh, at uh, remote sensing or some other applications that are of more interest to CSIROs and mineral groups. Yeah. So we're looking forward to that. And uh, thank you everyone for listening to us. Thanks Hassan and thanks to all of our interns, students and uh, collaborators who have been part of our papers. Thank you very much. Very much. I uh, did like the reference to inceptions and models in models in models and neural nets and nets and nets. Um, any questions from the floor here first before we go online? Yes. Bang. And Thomas? Me? Yeah. Okay. Bang. Yeah. A quick question about the your last uh, GNN on the uh, hyperspectral image classification. So you showed like a very good pre, um, 
Very, yeah, this study. Very good uh, accuracy in prediction, predicting the lithology. Like, how did you choose the test data for that? Because if you choose another totally new area, it, yeah. Yes, Esan, can you answer that? How did you use the test data for the hyper? -spectrum? Yeah, we actually we actually had ground samples from this study area, and I think there is a slide in there that shows the ground samples. Let me find the number and tell you through it. And it's this type. Of yeah, it's okay. slide forty-three. Yeah, slide forty-three. Yeah. Right. Yeah, these are actually our training samples, you know. What about the gray areas? It, that's a digital elevation model only. Those colorful areas, they're actually where we have ground samples from them. And yeah, we trained our you know, machine based on these samples. OK. So the colorful ones are the ones for training and the testing? Yes, yeah, actually we used 70% for training and 30% for testing. Okay. Yeah. So it's basically the same region, but different okay. yeah. locations are for the training the test set. Right. Yeah. This, can you use this in another area? I mean, uh, I think for, uh, this is, uh, this may not be same as like you do in other deep learning or machine learning approaches where you detect, uh, you know, heart disease or cancer or face recognition or object detection. Because the thing is, here the, the region itself, uh, your model needs to be trained on the region and the model is kind of more dependent on the region. Okay. Because if, if you have those, uh, you know, the levels that are there, in other regions, not all of those will be there, right? So that's a problem. We cannot have a super machine learning model for this. Esan, any comments? Well, not actually. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. You mentioned that you were using synthetic data sets for the negative data, and I was wondering what kind of bias that introduces if you have your observations for the positive data and, and the synthetic ones for the negative data, how do you manage the synthetic data and the observations? I think we, uh, to be frank, uh, that is a major limitation. And uh, we uh, used uh, the synthetic data generation, but we have not really addressed the uncertainty quantification and the biasness uh, in the, the decision making process. And that's where the it's more maybe more of a study for explainable AI and uh, uh, and things like that. Where we we need to look back in that, those areas and see how we can improve ourselves. And one way would be probably through Bayesian inference and uncertainty quantification through Bayesian inference. Um, can I add something? Yep. Well, actually, in this in this project, in, in, actually, in this slide, as you can see, it was a multi-class problem. You know, our goal was to you know predict which pixel belongs to which you know rock type, and uh, we didn't have a negative sample in this project. You know, but in uh, in the first project that I mentioned in, the, in prospectivity mapping, actually, our positive we created synthetic samples for the positive class. You know, for since we had only seven or eight, for example, you know nickel occurrence, you know, mineral occurrences in the in, in the whole South Australia. And we used this mode again to increase the number of positive samples. And at the same time, we had the problem of, you know, how to choose negative samples. And uh, we actually uh, used the PUL, positive and unlabeled learning, to address this problem. And positive and unlabeled learning problem actually approaches, you know, it's a binary classifier. And it uses the own data set, you know, to determine which data, which sample is more probable to be a positive sample or a negative sample. And it uh, determines this by, you know, uh, uh, calculating the distance between the positive samples and un unlabeled samples. And it learns a classifier and then assigns, you know, positive or negative labels to the samples. So, yeah. So, 
how many data samples you used for your training? In which project? So this the first is one? Uh, mythology mapping at CNN. Uh, this uh, here, it's actually, uh, this is not actually, it's, it's, this project was, uh, we used an unsupervised machine learning app, so we didn't have any training samples. So not otherwise than CNN is giving you like 99. CNN, yeah, in CNN. So I think you know, we had ground truth data from 10% or less, you know, of this of the total area of the study. So yeah, 10% of the total pixels, you know, that we had were our ground truth data. 10% of the total pixels. And yeah, and we split that to 70 and 30%. So 70% of that percent for training and 30% of the, that for 10% for testing. Yes. So yeah. for validation. And we, predict, and we predicted that the rest 90%. Well, we did not use a validation set uh, in there because uh, because our uh, predictions were already quite good. In uh, Generally in uh, machine learning, you use validation set when you're uh, you know, when there's overfitting, basically, and we didn't have overfitting. So basically, when we train, uh, like in convolution neural networks, you have a training data, and then you give uh, like a validation that your model is not overfitting or something. Yeah, so... We to, basically, we have, like, in, yeah, like, model is learning in the right direction. So, yeah, yes, uh, you, you use a validation set only when you're... Uh, Training data and test data are not very similar. So then you use your validation set to ensure that you do not overtrain or overfit. But if your training and test data is very similar and you're already, you know, your trial experiments are showing quite good results already on the test set, then there's no need for you to stop training earlier using a validation set. So basically, so you are, uh, when you are trained, so you are uh, like a uh, checking with the, your test data set, like it's going in the right direction. Right? Yeah, so you did some trial accuracy and then you are testing. Yes, uh, yes, we did some trial experiments and then we did our hyperparameter tooling on the trial experiments and we found that, okay, we do not need to, that for example, 50 epochs is okay to stop and that gives a reasonable prediction on the test set. Have you tried that the model? Sorry, just got one more question for you guys. Maybe you guys can have a chance. One, so it's a, a, totally an unseen data because this is not like the data have the same distribution. Or if, this, uh, if you have a data like a little bit of distribution, so have you checked like uh, what's uh, that your model will go wrong? Like 92, maybe it will go like 50% and 60%. Uh, but uh, we, yeah. I mean, maybe we can discuss about this later. Yeah. Uh, I have a question from Ehsan. Maybe, yeah. maybe he explain. I miss it. Uh, have you ever, for negative training for point for your prospectivity modeling, have you ever think about considering the non-critical mineral occurrences instead of synthesizing or making the negative points? Yeah, we haven't tried that. In but the thing that we observed in our, in our project is that the PUL is working perfectly. And it could, uh, you know, compared to the standard random forest, it could increase our accuracy 10% actually from 84 to 94. So, uh, we have, no, we didn't actually. No. And do you have any idea after uh, preparing the prospectivity model, which layer affects more the prospective zone or? Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we determined that, and we realized that you know, uh, the uh, our the geological map that we have, or better to say that the, the lithological map that we had from the study area, and that we downloaded that from the state uh, website of you know the geological state, uh, survey of South Australia. Okay. Okay. Uh, those the, those lithological units, you know, show the you know high correlation with uh, known mineral occurrences. And at the next ranking, you know, we had uh, geochemical data. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. So we have a couple of questions online. There's a hand up and there's Ivy as well. I'm not sure who was first, but um, maybe we can start with Ivy's question. 
Um, am I correct in my understanding that the regularization part of the workflow is preventing the model from overfitting significantly? Yes, uh, probably the dropout is helping it from overfitting and we are getting good generalization performance. Uh, how do you know? Because of the good generalization performance we get. You get some measures taken from the, from the dropout. Oh, uh, right. The dropout versus no dropout. Uh, Ehsan, did, do we have the dropout versus no dropout results? No, we haven't tested that. Yeah, we don't, we didn't have the known dropout results. But uh, since we were comparing with other machine learning models, we, we could have added that, but uh, it's in our framework, we can run it and it's open source. Yeah. Yeah, you can spend days, you know, to hyper parameter tuning. <laughs> machine learning models and yeah it's time actually to do the hyper parameter tuning and diff uh, try different values for different parameters uh, but these uh, in our CNN paper we didn't have dropout clear so uh, yeah and there's a hand online as well if someone would like to come off mute and ask your question yeah, if we still have time. I was just curious um, as to how, how I should understand what's happening with the vegetation in the hyperspectral imaging. So uh, I, I would have presumed that would um, be a very strong signal in there and you're trying to get stuff that's below vegetation. Is that not a problem because you are conditioning on separate regions and they have similar vegetation? Or, or is your um, order encoder learning some kind of vegetation feature which becomes uh, irrelevant in some sense or something else? What's going on? <laughs> The current map, do you mean this slide? Uh, well, I mean in the, in the hyperspectral uh, stuff generally, right? Uh, I guess this is part of that pipeline. But um, yeah, so it'd be interesting, for example, if uh, you um, were learnt, knowing that it was a thing that was occluded by um, some trees or whatever um, in your data set. Well, in actually, uh, when I, I actually, when I use, you know, supervised machine learning, I usually, and for example, in the project, uh, if you go, uh, if you read show slide 43 again, you know, in that study area, we didn't have any vegetation, actually, it was part of it, you know, unvegetated area. And, uh, but if we had, you know, I actually would choose, you know, uh, some pixels from the vegetated areas and based on our ground truth data, data, and we could train our machine based on that. Um, I don't know if I got your question correctly or correctly or not, but yeah. So if we get, if we take some samples from the, those pixels that show vegetation, vegetated areas, so we can address this problem and discriminate between different lithological units and, you know, vegetation or or even water bodies you know on the surface and yeah and and in our clustering you know project you know we realized that the combination of sentinel 2 and uh, stacked auto encoder is able to discriminate between uh, vegetation and water bodies itself without training you know with training yeah. samples you know it can itself you know discriminate between water bodies and other Lithological units, and it was interesting to me. And Sentinel two was the only data set that was able to do that, and and I think it's due to the high result, spatial resolution of Sentinel two data, which is ten meter. And yeah, and Landsat eight and Astor failed to do that. Interesting. That leads to some follow-on questions, but I think we're out of time, so maybe I won't actually be asking them right this time. Yeah, second. we might uh, close, close the meeting. Thanks, Dan. Um, but yeah, follow up with these guys otherwise. So um, apologies for going over time, but thanks for everyone for coming, um, either in person or online. Um, and thank you to Rohit, Essan, for your efforts. Um, very thanks, interesting. Mark, and thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Essan. Thank you. Have See a good you. night. <laughs> you too. Bye bye. <laughs>